for great and marvelous are thy glory, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy names,
Speak to your heart tonight, where you're with us. There's a supper for everyone afterwards tonight. Slightly different meeting tonight in some ways. Uh, we look back over the Lord's faithfulness to us as a people over 14 years. I believe it's important to come and to thank the Lord, to acknowledge all that He's done, to give Him praise, and to look to Him and give Him all the glory for the great things that He's done. And as we look in for the future, and the Lord tarries, of course, because the Lord can come back tonight. But if the Lord ties, we're believing God for great things in the days of Him. You say, Amen. We believe that. We believe our God is able. Amen. There's not, it's impossible with man, but nothing is impossible with Him tonight. Amen. Ask this this night. If anyone collapses, I'd be probably first to go. But uh, all right. If you've got a good heart and you're ready to go, praise the Lord. If you're not ready to go, you need to get ready to go. Because He could come or call at any moment. And that's a very sober thing. It's good to be ready to meet the Lord. This might go off a couple of times tonight, but it's, it's okay. We need it just to do what we're doing. Amen. It's good to be here. We're going to pray. Just bring this meeting before the Lord tonight. Pray the Lord along with you and just speak in the hearts tonight. Amen. Amen. Sister Carol, can you bring this meeting before the Lord tonight? And we just breathe you and we just stand to you as we do it for us. That makes a face. And we just thank you, Heavenly Father, for raising up this one. We just thank you that we can look back on 14 years of your faithfulness. And we just return thanks to you. And our Heavenly Father, we just pray for each and every one that takes part tonight, that you will be on to them all that they need. And as we look back, and as we return back, and as we look forward, we just praise you and we just thank you. The end is not yet. Amen. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are the God of the much more. And oh God, we just look forward to what you're going to do in the years that I have in your life. Just undertake for this meeting. Tonight we pray. Cover me the precious shed blood. For we ask it in your precious name. Giving me all the glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. I just want to go through uh, just some of the announcements for the week. Will I change over to this other one? Yes. <laughs> At least it's not going to make anyway, but that's probably true. The announcements for the week, just to remember, Tuesday through the Thursday, um, this week, we're just having three days of prayer uh, to seek the Lord just for our loved ones, our families, for this time, for, for our nation at this time to believe and pray and seek the Lord. You know, we're living in awesome days, and uh, we want to just come before the Lord over these three days. So it's 6 o'clock each morning. And uh, 7.30 each night we'll meet together as a church and pray and seek the Lord together. And just believe the Lord uh, for the days in which we're in. So that's Tuesday uh, through the Thursday. Then just on Saturday, this Saturday um, at 11 a.m. here at the church, for as many as possibly can, we're going to uh, go around the doors. The, mission, the children's mission starts on Monday night, that's tomorrow week. And uh, we just want to go around the different areas in the town and fight. Uh, just the, the children in for, for the children's mission are going to be from Monday through to Friday, then on the Sunday night uh, there will be a, a family service and that's on Sunday the 23rd I believe it is, amen. Just also for those uh, Sunday school and crash notice, just if you're interested in helping in that area, uh, we just sign on the sheet, just come through the doors here to the left hand side, and of course we'll be going through the proper procedure with uh, the NI access NI and the peace checks. 
and I'll do this uh, for you. So if you're interested in help in the map area, you put your name down. And, uh, yes. Sunday school, will you put your names on as well, just so I know that you want to keep to the Sunday school? That's okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to lift an offering over to the Lord. We'll sing that we chorus Jesus shall take the highest honor. Amen. And that we'll stand together tonight as we lift an offering over to the Lord. tonight just for your anointing and your help Lord just as we come to your word for these few moments that you would undertake for us that you would speak to us Lord that you would give us ears to hear Lord most of all our cry tonight and our desire is that you be glorified among us we ask all these mercies in Jesus name amen for those who are not familiar with the story I'm going to read from getting a wee bit of feedback Victoria um just in this great chapter, you know, God's people, God had delivered them out of Egypt. He had brought them through the Red Sea and he had desired to bring them into the promised land that he had promised them. And for 40 years they had wandered in a wilderness. And then it came to the time that they were going to pass over the River Jordan into the land of promise to possess that land, that land in which the Lord had promised them. They needed a miracle in order to cross the Jordan, they needed the Jordan to part. And uh, the, the people of God were waiting and God uh, began to speak to them. In chapter 3, if you just turn back and you see a couple of verses there, the Lord had told them in verse 4 about bringing that Ark of the Covenant and 
entering into that sea and believing as they would step into that water that the Lord would part the their waters and they would be able to come in. And it says there in verse 4, you shall, Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way which you must go. For ye have not passed this way before. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. God was about to perform great miracles in the midst of his people. God was going to show himself for the great God that he is to his people. And so Joshua was instructed that he should take 12 men, one of each of the tribes, and they would lift up the Ark of the Covenant, and they would step into the water. And as soon as the soles of their feet would come into that water, the miraculous part of God would part that river, and then all the people of God would pass over in that dry ground into the promise that God had for them. And so in chapter 4, we... That's the background of the story. But in chapter 4 it says, And when it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command you them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priests' feet stood firm, twelve stones, And ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. And Joshua called twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according unto the number of the tribes of Israel that this may be a sign among you. And here's the key. You just listen to this important verse tonight. This would be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean you by these stones? Just listen for a moment. This is really critical for God's people. God had shown his miraculous hand. God had shown his miraculous power. He had delivered them out of Egypt. He had brought them through the Red Sea. He had guided them through the wilderness. And now they came to the River Jordan. And God had instructed them again. Those 12 men that were to lift up the Ark of the Covenant, which is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the presence of God, And they were to step into that river Jordan. And when they stepped in by faith, the waters would part. And all of Israel walked over that river Jordan on dry ground into the promised land that God had for them. And so then Joshua is encouraging them and saying, Now when you pass over, this is important, instruct 12 men to go back in, down into that river bed, Walk down into where the men had stood holding the Ark of the Covenant. If you can picture this in your mind, the miraculous part of God, the supernatural part of God. And there they would stand and as they came down, where the feet of these men stood, they were to take a rock. Each of each tribe, 12 men, they would lift a rock, put it on their shoulder. They'd come up out of the River Jordan and then they would set these rocks in a, in, a, in a pile as a memorial. And the key for that was this. That when your children ask you. What mean of these stones? Praise the Lord. There's one boy that's been listening. When your children. See I asked the kids to do it. Because they had no chance with the grown ups. But when your children ask you. What mean of these stones? We're going to have to do it better than that. When your children ask you, What made of these stones? And kids, will we try the grown-ups? Kids, be quiet. Where do you see this? Yes, we didn't ask the grown-ups. When your children ask you, What made of these stones? Oh, I'll tell you what. They've done it better than you kids, so you really have to go for it this time. So when your children ask you, What made of these stones? Oh, you're beating them now. That's great. <laughs> these stones were a testimony. They were markers. They were key points that when their children asked them, you forgot about it this time, what meaneth these stones? 
that the fathers would say to their sons, this is what God done for us. God has done great things for us. And you can see a father, a Jewish father, gathering his boy. And the boy looking at those stones, saying, Daddy, would you tell me, what was all that about? And then the dad would say, Son, I want to tell you something about this great God that we serve. You know, when we were stuck on the other side of that Jordan, and there was a promise for us to possess the land, we needed to go through, we needed a miracle. We needed a miracle. We needed the supernatural power. With us, it was impossible. We couldn't do it. But we heard the instruction from Joshua, and Joshua told us that we would walk in with the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, where the Shekinah glory would dwell. And when we stepped in, we seen the supernatural power of God come down, and the waters broke open. And all of us began to walk over on dry land as we seen the supernatural power of God. And son, when we got to the other side, so that it would be a memorial to you, when you ask, he sent 12 men back in again to bring out those stones and set them down. And you've come to ask me, this is the great things God has done for us. Do you know this, this verse over the past number of weeks as we're approaching this anniversary, this verse has been coming to me time and time again. What meaneth these stones? The great things the Lord has done for us. You know, it may not be great in the sight of the world. It may not be great even by comparison to some of the great works that are about Ulster, but you know, it's great to us. God's been great. He's been awesome. And so... When your children ask you, what meaneth these stones? Right, come on now. Yes, they're all falling asleep. When your children ask you, what meaneth these stones? Thank you, Peter. You're a bit slow. Keep up with them now. You're going to take a rock. And each rock is going to be a testimony of what God has done. When our kids ask us, Daddy, did that really happen? We're going to be able to say, son, listen, our God really did come through. Our God really did show his great and his mighty hand. Our God was faithful. On the 12th of June, 2005, seems like about 100 years ago now, it's only 14, we put a rock down. We put a stone down. And that stone was simply a vision of what God had called us to, to bound the hinge. God had spoken into our hearts, Nicky and I, and God had directed us through the prophetic word, confirmed in the mouth of two witnesses, put it in our hearts to come to a town called bound the hinge, a town that we have no connection with, a town that we are not in any way have any relations to or anything like that there. We were told of the Lord just to come to Balna Hinch and to plant a work. And he gave us a verse. We got the verse. And the verse was, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairs of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwell in. And he gave us a vision. He gave us a heart. He gave us his heart, a vision for this work. To believe God, to plant a church in Balnehenge. I still ask the question, why Balnehenge? But I know God has purposed that. And so he gave us that. The next slide there, Vic. And so we met in the market house 14 years ago. We had to take a leap of faith because our first month's rent was £240. And this was a, this was a leap of faith. It was like, Lord, how are we, how are we going to do this? How are we going to meet And yet the Lord opened a way for us to meet in the market house on the 12th of June 2005. And by his mercy and by his grace and through his faithfulness, we were able to meet the first month's rent. And then the second month. Mm -hmm. And then the third month. And God's hand was upon us. The next slide, Vic. Do you recognize anyone there? (laughs) That's me 14 years ago. That's what happens when you pastor a church, by the way. 
There's a few changes up there, and there's a few wee babies up there, but they're not wee babies anymore. Well, they're still my wee babies. Where are they? They're, hey, there they are over there. God, that's our first day, the 12th of June, uh, 2005. And the mercy and the hand of the Lord was upon us. Next slide there, Vic. If we have it. He also gave us a prayer hall. And that prayer hall was out at our home. And uh, this is it here. And we had to renovate the wee prayer hall. We met in there to pray, to seek the Lord. We met in Lila's barn as well just before that. We had to renovate that building. Remember renovating the building? We had to believe the Lord for £3,186. That was a miracle. And there's, there's another young girl you may not recognize there. But there's Don Joy and Lydia who helped in the renovation and painting up the wee building. And that wee verse that in all things that he would have the preeminence. And we got a wee prayer hall opened. Began to pray, began to seek the Lord, seen the hand of the Lord and the mercy of God, the market house and the prayer hall. And God's been good. He gave us a vision. And that vision, I, want to, I just want to share this with you. That vision was to plant the work in Balna Hinch. But that work would be a hub or a center. And from that place, and we haven't seen the fulfillment of that yet, but from that place, Life would be planted out. Churches would be planted around. County down. We'd see revival. It wouldn't be by any other means. But through prayer and believe in God. And we'd see a move of the spirit of God. A revival in Balna Hinch. And from that place. Life would be planted around the county of County Down. Because Balna Hinch is the center. The center town of the county. Unbeknown to us. I just want to share this with you. Because it's not our vision. It's his heart. But I shared that with Sister Lila, who comes Sunday morning, sits down at the back, shared it with Brother Davy McConville. But Davy must be 40 years ago, more maybe now, 50 years ago. It was 40 years ago back, 14 years ago. So it's over 50 years ago. Sister Lila and her husband, Will Malcolmson, Paul and Keith's daddy, they came into Balna Hinch and Davy would come along and on and they would hold missions here in the Legion Hall that hold children's missions. And God gave Will 40, 50 years ago a vision for Balna Hinch to be a center, a hub. And from that place, life would go out and God would move by spirit. We didn't know that. And when we shared it with Lila, Lila, you know Lila, she just began to rejoice because this is God's heart. It's not the heart of man, it's his heart. And we're aligning ourselves with the purpose of God. And so... From the beginning, we've seen the hand of the Lord upon the work and his blessing. And we've seen God's hand directing us in those early days. That's the prayer hall. One of the key things that we were going to look at in the early days. Now, when our children ask us, what made these there's only one alive. <laughs> I'm going to try over this side, Joshua. You stay with me. When your children ask you, George, are you going to help us? <laughs> shy like your daddy when they ask is one of the key things Lid's going to come and share so what meaneth these stones well what meaneth this stone okay so my stone the thing gave me do I just put up there then it says kids work so hands up if you've been in the lighthouse club ever Margaret Ward that includes you <laughs> <laughs> the youth work the young adults or the Sunday school. That's quite a lot of us in this room. Um, this stone was laid 12 years ago, and that's before a lot of the wee ones were even born. But who laid that stone? Who laid that stone in the foundation of the work? Well, like Tim said, we were in the market house and we were looking for a building, but we didn't have one. There was nowhere in the building for the children really to meet. Uh, I think it was Nikki, I probably should have checked, but I remember, I think it was Nikki who said that when she was praying, she knew if we, we get the children, we start it anyway, God will provide the building. So before um, we had the church building, like, like I said, we were in the market house, but then we rented the leisure center just to start the children's work, to start the very first lighthouse club. So um, Dawn, Joy, who's, <laughs> Dawn Joy, who's on the the, the picture there, 
she headed the club and me and Lainey just helped her with it. Um, so it was April 2007, was the first ever Lighthouse Club. That was before you were even born. And um, so, like I said, it was over in the Leisure Centre. Um, Dawn Joy's first message, sorry, there was three kids came, Callum and Jimmy, Rice and we Rodney, you'd still see them in the town, and they've changed, they're up there, but we're still able to, it's the same message to them, you know, we're able to tell them, and they'll say, I know, I know, I know, I will, I will, I will, you know, just, but three kids came, and Dawn Joy preached on the Good Shepherd, and you know, the, the kids may not know this, the adults do, because I've told everyone that cares to listen, me and Dawn Joy wrote the Lighthouse Club song, <laughs> and if Ruth and Andy were here, they they would confirm that it's the kids' favorite. So, <laughs> but um, so yes. So Dawn Joy began that work in the lighthouse in the lighthouse club just round in the leisure center. Me and Lainey would have helped. Dawn Joy also took the youth work, and there was one child in the youth. And is he? I don't know if he's still in. There he is at the back. Jonathan Nixon was the only member of the youth. <laughs> so I remember Jonathan saying, "Flip sick." She made me open in prayer, end in prayer, and I think I prayed in between. So Jonathan got all everything to do. So um, so that w and the Woodsies also came to the youth as well back then. And um, then the Sunday school was just one boy, and that was Jack McElrath, and I was a Sunday school teacher. And so you know they were great days. Honestly, I look I call them the glory days. <laughs> but I look back and I just remember one time with the youth rally and Dawn Joy preached at the youth rally. It was in the market house and there was no one there. But about 10 minutes before we went over to the field where there were all the kids would have sat and drank all the teenagers. Me and Dawn Joy were hyper for days afterwards. Honestly, they, they'd never come to anything that we'd put on, you know, but we said, come on over. Would you just come over? We walked over to the market house, we felt like the Pied Piper. They all followed us with the carryouts, and we got to the we got to the the market house, and they all says, "Oh, we couldn't take drinking," so they all hid the drink, and in they came and they listened to the gospel. I remember Dawn Jay texted Dad afterwards, and she said, "Dad, they did Mexican waves. They heckled me. They shouted." She said it was the best night ever. Yeah. She preached the gospel to them. They heard the, the word of God, and um, they were happy, happy days. And then, you know. I just was thinking, I'm from Liverpool, and any time we would drive through the Mersey Tunnel, when you were kids, your mom or dad, my uncle Colin or someone would say, oh, men gave the life for this, you know, they'd say men, men died, and you'd think as you were going through, it was just weird to think, the building a tunnel underwater, and you think, oh, men died, and I just googled it today, 17 men gave the life in that work, you know, mm. and I looked up the Hoover Dam, I think it was... Um, 96 men died in that building, you know, but they're important buildings. And, you know, I just was thinking about this work. And, you know, kids, this um, this stone was laid. You know, she started that kids' work. And, you know, Dawn Joy went home to be with the Lord. You know, her life was given, you know. And I know she went with, a, it was a brain tumor, but I thought today, you know, her life was given long before it was taken. You know, mm. she laid the foundation of the children's work. And you know that work, she has gone on to be with the Lord, a life given, just everything was Christ. You know, um, the lighthouse, me and Lainey then did a stint of taking the lighthouse, but you are glad you didn't come to the lighthouse in that stint. <laughs> Because then Andy and Ruth came and they took over the work and the lighthouse is still going today. Um, the youth fellowship then I would have taken and then Brent and now Vic's continuing the work of the youth fellowship. And now there's a young adult that me and Brent would have taken and now that's on with the NASA's. You know, it continues to grow on that stone. So kids, what meaneth this stone? That was the stone of the kids' work. Amen. Amen. So we've got two stones, and when your kids ask you, what what mean mean they stones? they're nearly getting there, Trisha's going to come and share a key point for us in the work. Well, I think I've got a boulder, not a stone. <laughs> this is the minibus. So the lighthouse had started in 2007, and obviously some kids were starting to come in. 
And in 2008, um, I work for a company called the Cedar Foundation. It's an organization for people with disabilities. So we have different homes. And these homes would have minibuses where people would be taken to their day centers and shopping and different things. So obviously they knew, my boss knew that's what we were doing. So obviously I would tell, you know, about different things about the church and what was happening. And uh, he came to me in 2008 and he said that um, one of the minibuses, they were going to sell it. And normally one of the big churches, Whitewell, normally would have taken a lot of the Cedar Foundation's minibuses. And he said to me, Do you, would your church be able to use the minibus? So obviously my first question was, how much? Um, so I think at that point they were maybe looking about two grand or something like that at that point. So um, obviously I was conversing back and forth with Tim and we had no money because we were only just a couple of years on the road and there was a very small group in office, no money. So I said to him, I said, look, Jim, we don't have any money. You know, maybe we need to try and bring this down. But on being on to us, obviously Andy and Ruth still lived in Scotland and they got wind of what was happening. But John Joy had had a little savings account and in that savings account was a thousand pounds. And they phoned Tim and they had said to Tim, look, we heard about the minibus. We'd like to donate this money toward the minibus if that would help in any way, because it would just be something they wanted to do for just a remembrance for Don Joy. So I came to my boss and I just went through then the whole story about Don Joy. And this was her savings. And, you know, we've only got a thousand pounds, Jim. That's all we have. So just leave it with you. So he went and he spoke to the, the CEO and everything else. And they came back and they said, look, you give us the thousand pound, we'll give you the minibus. So we got the big green bus. And the big green bus lasted us 10 years. And so last year, obviously 2018, well, I didn't really know that we were praying for a new minibus at that point. But um, I knew that it was like kind of on its last legs or wheels or whatever. And... Um, <laughs> So my boss then phoned me up and said, um, Tricia, we have a minibus here. We're selling another minibus. Would your church be able to use it? And I, so I phoned Tim and I says, Tim, there's a minibus. He says, Tricia, we've been praying for a minibus. We need a new minibus. He says, ask him how much. So, um, they were looking well more this time because it was a very good minibus and good repair and everything. So, <coughs> Um, we kind of sort of said around two, didn't we? We kind of really, we didn't want to give too much, but, you know, we wanted to keep it. So I says, look, obviously we don't have much money again, but um, what, what are you looking? So they were saying more like near, probably near the 3,000. So I says, look, that's just too much. We don't really have that. So it was kind of going on with the bosses back and forward and stuff. And at the end, we offered them two, two. Isn't that right? And we have... Like a brand new the minibus, and it's like it's a fantastic bus, and probably worth a lot more than two two. <laughs> so that's what meaneth these stones. Praise the Lord, and it's a Mercedes. <laughs> this may not seem like anything, but this was everything when a young girl's legacy and our wee savings was sowing to bring kids under the sound of the gospel. And I tell you, when we were renovating this building, it was the hardest working worker amongst us, that green bus. It's transferred and transported everything. And the Lord's been good. And every time we didn't have the money, but God, you know, just after that, when we got the figure of 2,200, I think it was a few days later that someone gave a gift to the church of £8,000. We were able to buy it. And so it's the miracle of God, the hand and the provision, and God teaching us something. And we'll find out about that at the end. But when your children ask you, What means these stones? We're starting to get it now. Brother Dave is going to come. Amen. Amen. You all see this one. Eden Grove. Eden Grove. Eden Grove. I'm just going to rearrange these a wee bit here. So as you've heard, we met, originally we met in the market house and we were quite tight for space up there and, and we'd met, one time we actually met in a chip shop, which was Maggie's place just round the corner there 
Um, when we were in the market house, we had to share the facilities there with other groups. Um, but in 2007, the Lord opened the door for us um, just up on the end of the street here in Eden Grove Halls and opposite the library there. Eden Grove Presbyterian Church has had a witness in Balnehinch since 1770. And that hall at times felt like it had been up 250 <laughs> years. Um, but although it wasn't quite that old, there was a bit of work that needed to be done to tidy it up. Um, so that we could hold meetings there. So we met there until 2016. And during this time, we had many great meetings in there. It included two weddings. We had Mr. and Mrs. Brent Porter. Mr. and Mrs. Jonathan Nixon were married in that building. And honestly, the work that the church came together and the building looked absolutely fantastic for those wedding days. When you seen the state it, it was in at times. It needed more than a lick of paint. But the Lord really blessed us with that building. Mm -hmm. Many great meetings. We also had um, our first indoor baptisms um, <laughs> in that building. Um, for those of you that were baptized in the sea, sorry, but we did. We had some indoor baptisms there. Um, we also had a, a funeral in that church, our first church funeral. Uh, and this was a service of thanksgiving for a man, a gentleman named Brian Woodall. Mm -hmm. For those of you who didn't know Brian, Brian was a lovely gentleman. He was a, a Korean War veteran from Yorkshire. And Brian was wonderfully saved as an older man. And he loved to be around um, the church family here in Balna Hinch. And then during the summer months over in, in the other building, we would have had open air meetings. Um, we got the gazebo up, and the weather was actually probably like tonight. Most of those meetings we were dodging the rain in and out and watching for lightning strikes and all sorts. But it was lovely just to have that witness, um, you know, still on the main street for the, the speakers to be set up, and that, that Christian witness went out. Um, and it was a time when we grew as a church, um, both numbers wise you know i'm seeing faces here that would have come in to eden grove hall uh, but also spiritually we grew you know the lord stretched us personally you know even i can speak for myself during those open air meetings and um, pastor tim would just pounce on you and say brother give us a testimony sister so everybody in those meetings was prepared just to step forward to the microphone and tell people what the lord had done in their lives you know, by faith, God provided us with £4,295 to refurbish that building. And that work that included fitting a, a brand new, a new kitchen um, and also the flooring and, and the painting of the walls in there. So all together, uh, we were in that building around about nine years. Uh, and the Lord really blessed us during our time there. Amen. Now, when your children ask you, what do you think? Now, David said, I'm going to pounce. I used to pounce on people. I'm going to pounce on a few tonight because this next rock is very important to us because it was our desire to see people get saved. And God has, Brian has mentioned, or David has mentioned, Brother Brian Woodhull has been home to be with the Lord. But to see souls saved, whether it's the children or whether it's in the, through the tent missions or whatever it was. That was our desire, and that's still our desire, is to see souls saved. So Brent is going to come up, he doesn't know this, and Emma's going to come up. And where's Kim? Don't be sliding down your chair. Would you come up to Kim? 30 seconds each and tell us about the day you could see it. Come on ahead, Brent. Come on ahead, Kim, you can come on up and stand with him, yes. Amen. I got saved on the 17th of June 2009, so next week I'll be saved by the grace of God 10 years. You know, Amen. Amen. Um, I just thank the Lord for what he has done in my life. You know, I lived a life just in children's homes, care homes, all those sorts of things. You will get involved in crime, petty crime, drugs. You know, but at the, at the age of 27, you know, my life was absolutely wrecked. You know, wrecked and ruined. You know, Paul the Apostle says, you know, what I wanted to do. I couldn't do and what I didn't want to do, I ended up doing, you know, mm -hmm. I destroyed a life that was totally destroyed by sin, you know, and uh, I came, was in and out of prison and whatever else, but, you know, just came to the end of myself, you know, but I often use 
that story, you know, of the Good Samaritan, you know, he was walking to uh, Jerusalem and it says that the thieves and the robbers, they came and they beat him and they stripped him and they set him, they put him at the side of the road and, you know, they left him bleeding and dying, you know, but uh, it says that the religious, they came across him and they walked by and they could do nothing for him. You know, in this world, I came to the point in my life, this world could do nothing for me. You know, I tasted of all the pleasures of this world, I'd done everything, you know, but there was nothing this world could supply. You know, the world told me I was messed up, that I needed help, that I needed, you know, tried psychiatrists, psychologists, all those things. You know, I didn't want to be the person that I was. I didn't want to be, you know, a bad person. Didn't want to be an alcoholic. Didn't want to be a drug addict. Didn't want to be all of those things. But, you know, I went for help to the world, and they couldn't help me. You know, but it says in that wee story, you know, it says, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. And it says that a good Samaritan came along, and he lifted him out of the gutter. And he poured in the oil and the wine and he bound up the wounds. You know, I had many wounds, many defects, you know. I had many problems, many issues, you know. And they never, I would always say, no, nah, no, nah, well, you know, with no mum, really, when I was younger, I never knew a father and all those things. With those things, I'd always say, well, they didn't really affect, but they do affect you in some way. You know, they never held me back from getting jobs and all those things. But they, they left me with issues, you know, not emotional issues, oh, poor me, but, you know, just dysfunctional. You know, but friends, it says he bound up the wind and he poured in the oil and the wine, you know, and he says, you know, I often said, you know, live my whole life not knowing my father, but you know, they see the day in the hour I get saved, and you had a heavenly father who cared for me and who loved me, and I was able to love my two kids then, for the love of the good father was in me, you know, and just, you know, just I was speaking to my uncle the other day, I, I was driving back from Castle Well and doing a delivery and work, and I was met my uncle at the filling station and he says I, I said I had my aunt which is his sister he says I had her out for her birthday I says I'd like to I'd like to take her out more and I'd like to do for her because I appreciate what she'd done for me all those years she was always the sort of the pillar in my life you know and uh, he says no no don't worry about it friend he says you know the reward for her is to see what see you doing well the reward for her is you and having those two lads and I says I, I know I was thinking about it the other day you know the depths of the spur that I was in, the depths of the spur, the depths. And he says, ah, he says, we don't forget it, friend. He says, you might forget it, but we don't forget it. He says, because we often talk about it. He says, you know, Daphne's my sister, and I go around there, and he says, we often talk about it. He says, it's the closest thing to a miracle yeah. we're ever going to see. Mm -hmm. That's how dear friends, it's not the miracle of the night is the new birth. Mm -hmm. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Yes. All the old things pass away, and everything becomes new. Christ deserves all the glory to Amen. 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 Jesus. That's all for. Um, just Brent said next week he'll be saved 10 years. So Tuesday week, I'll be saved a year on the 18th of June. And just give glory to God for it. Um, before I was saved, um, I mean, I was a good person, but I was obviously living in sin. And I knew I needed saved. I grew up in a Christian home. But from an early age, I turned away from God. I did not want that life that I seen my parents lived in my shame. Uh, but now I, I'm thankful. And I was so blessed to be brought up in a Christian home. And I had praying parents and a praying sister. Um, but I had what I thought as a young girl. I mean, I'm say the 26 and now 27. But I thought I had everything in life. And I came to a point where, yes, I had the friends at the social end, at everything going on, but I had an emptiness in my life. There was something missing. And no matter what I, I turned to, what, no matter what I tried to get involved with, this, this emptiness wasn't being filled. And no matter what it was, I just knew. I remember one night, it was maybe weeks before I was saved, I remember looking out my bedroom through the window and I actually was in floods of tears. And I was actually asking myself, I was like, what am I doing? There has to be more to this life. And there is. And that was Christ. And on the 18th of June, I surrendered my life to Christ. And I have not looked back for one day. And I give glory to God that he did save me. It was in Paula's house. And I'll never forget it. But this, I, was at, I was actually here the Sunday before then. And Brent was preaching that night. And he said that night, the spirit of God will not always strive with man. And that pierced my heart. And I could not get away from that. And I just knew within myself, I knew I, could, I knew I needed to make a decision. And it was either to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior or to reject him once again. But I wasn't willing to take that risk. It, it's not worth the gamble. That
The enemy will come and he will try and distract you. He will tell you that you have things ahead of you and it's all flashing lights and it's great fun. It's a lie from the pit of hell. The world has nothing to offer you. It will lead you into destruction. It will bring you into the loneliest of places. You will be in darkness. But Jesus Christ came to give us life and he set me free on the 18th of June who the sun sets free is free indeed. I was delivered that day and I was saved and I praise God tonight that he saved me. Amen. Okay, so um, I'm saved a year past on the 6th of May. Praise God for that. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a very quick learner. So I was saved at a very young age, only unfortunately I decided I would go the opposite way and I became badly backslidden. To get me to repentance, the Lord had to break me and I got to some broken places. March last year, my second eldest tried to commit suicide. The day after I cried out to the Lord. Psalm 34. The soul of man cried and the Lord heard me. And he heard me and he pulled me out of the pit and he saved me and he's changed me. And you know, you do go through this walk and you do go through difficult times, but I don't do it on my own anymore. Amen. And anybody that does have difficult times, there's an answer. And you know, whenever you give your life to the Lord, no matter how hard your walk is, it's so much better this way. Amen. Do you know, I came to this church <laughs> on the 6th of May last year, and I sat at the back of this hall thinking, well, everything was against me to get here. But I got here, I was driven to get here, and I sat at the back of this hall, and I heard every word. But in my head, I was taunted, taunted badly with, you're going to make a fool out of yourself. Nobody in this church even knows you've never been here before. But you know, when we came to close, Tim had said, anybody backslidden or unsaved, just raise your hand. And I couldn't raise my hand because I also had this voice saying, put your hand down, there's always another time. But I also knew that... You know, like Nick, like Emma said, God won't always strive with man. And the Lord had asked me before and I had refused. I knew if I refused again this time, I wasn't going to get another opportunity. So if he's calling you, don't harden your heart to him. Just give your life to him. That taunt in your head is a taunt of the devil. And you see, whenever you just take that step in faith, it all goes, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit and with power. Yeah, so all I can tell you is that I'm saved, wonderfully saved, and I thank God that he saved me. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now when your children ask you, What do you Brother Brown's going to come and tell us, Amen. This is the stone of prayer, and this this stone this stone represents the, this church, and this and how it was birthed. It was birthed in prayer, and not only was it birthed in prayer, but it's the engine room. It's the engine room. And as where things happen, prayer moves the hand of God. Yeah. And in 14 years, we have seen in this place many answers to prayer. Amen. We've seen people that we've prayed for night after night, and then... They got wonderfully saved. Amen. We've seen people that were sick and we've seen them wonderfully healed. Amen. I'm going to share something that happened just this past week. On Monday night, we were here in the revival prayer meeting and we're praying for a fella that was dying from cancer, Sammy. 
And he doesn't live that far from where I live. And we're praying for Sammy last Monday night in this prayer meeting. I got a phone call last night at 11 o'clock. I was just nicely tucked into bed. <laughs> <laughs> and the phone rang and answered the phone. And it was uh, a fella, Ian. He's, he told me, he says, Sammy's got saved. Amen. Amen. Sammy's got saved. Amen. You know, that's, that's a result of prayer. I know f f prayer is the vital work mm -hmm. in this place. Amen. The Bible says, my house yeah. shall be called the house of prayer. Mm -hmm. I know we are here. We are here and we've met many times for prayer. But you know, our heart's prayer is, is for a mighty revival. Amen. A mighty revival around Balhinch. A mighty revival across this land. Do you know what I was reading today about, you know, the prayer of faith? You know, about this mountain shall be removed mm -hmm. and shall be cast into the sea. And we are we're, we're believing that the mountains of sin mm -hmm. that's across this land of suicide, of alcohol, of drugs, and worldliness that has gripped so many people, that that'll be cast into the sea, mm -hmm. and there'll be a mighty move of God, yes. that there'll be real conviction of sin, that people will realize, those that are lost, that they realize they have a soul, mm -hmm. that they have a precious soul that's going to live forever and ever in one of two eternities. And we're only passing through here. The Bible says our life is but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Mm. And it's what you do with your life. Do you know, 30 years ago, I took that step of faith mm -hmm. and I accepted Jesus into my heart and into my life. I realized I was a lost sinner in the sight of a holy God. And I realized that I needed to get saved if ever I was going to see heaven, mm -hmm. that, if, that ever I was going to meet, meet my Savior. And you know, I took that step of faith and I accepted Jesus into my heart and into my life. I know many of us in this room here tonight took that step of faith and accepted Jesus into our hearts and into our lives. But those that are amongst us mm -hmm. that are not saved, you know what our cry is and our prayer is? Oh, that you would take that step of faith and you would realize in the sight of a holy God that you're a lost sinner, that you're lost and you're in the road to hell and that you'll take that step of faith and you accept Jesus into your heart and into your, into your life. Mm. What meaneth these stones? Do you know this, the, the prayer, this prayer stone, I believe it's the real cornerstone mm. in this place. Amen. Amen. So when your children ask you, What be a feast of? Trevor's going to tell us. Amen. <laughs> For anybody at the back, can't see that. That says new building. My stone. Mm -hmm. um, David there talked about the Eden Grove Halls. And um, we were there for maybe eight, eight or nine years. But then it came the time um, we were told to vacate the Eden Grove Halls. So uh, the search was on then for a new building, for a new home. And there was a number of ideas you know, came about. I think I'm, I'm right in thinking there was one stage we even thought about going outside of the town to a field and putting a, mm -hmm. a porta cabin up. Or is it a, is it a modular building they call them now or something? <laughs> you know? But um, there was many things bandied about. But after much prayer and seeking the Lord, for direction and guidance, the Lord directed us to this building. And he put on our hearts to offer a figure of £50,000 to purchase this place. Now, as most of you know, certainly from within the church anyway, 
we didn't have 50,000 pounds. <laughs> Simple as. Um, but again, we went forward in prayer and trusting the Lord and believing in God. And, you know, if we can give what we can, well then, God would multiply it. You know, if you think back in the scriptures there, you know, how the Lord fed the 5,000, you know, five loaves, mm -hmm. two fishes, and there was even baskets left over. Mm -hmm. As Tim said earlier on, you know, there's nothing impossible with our God. There's nothing too hard for our God. So, of course, the £50,000 was just the cost to purchase the building. Um, and the building needed a lot of work done to it. And there's a lot more going to be needed to make it into the building that we have here today. So, in total, God provided £184,161 to purchase and refurbish this building. Amen. Right? And with the help of the people, the work was finished and the doors were opened on the 9th of June, sorry, the 9th of January 2016. But is the work finished? Mm. You know, the Lord has since blessed us with another building out the back. And, you know, he's not finished yet. Amen. To be continued. Amen. 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 So when your children ask you, What means this? Now we're really getting into it. Leanne's going to tell us about the next story. <laughs> So this stone is for Harmony Christian School. Um, we officially received notification from the Department of Education that we are officially registered as an independent Christian school on the 24th of May 2019. So not even a couple of weeks ago. But let me tell you, you might not think there's a lot to say about this because we've only been established a couple of weeks. But would you believe that it was actually back in May 2008 that we had our very first meeting that there was going to be a Christian school birthed by um, this wee church. May 2008, I just go, wow, you know. Um, the Lord had put it on our hearts. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. The Lord had put that verse on Pastor Tim and Miss Nikki's heart. There was Jack and there was Luke and there was Caleb in the fellowship. That was their only children. But yet the Lord had put it on their hearts that we, would, we were to prepare an ark to the saving of their house and of the families that belong to this fellowship. How was that going to happen? We didn't know. But by faith, we had that wee first meeting just to see if there might be you know, any interest back in May 2008. And then, you know, sort of the doors seemed to, to close for us, you know, that, that we weren't going to go forward at that time. I um, suppose after that then, um, David and I, we had Joshua, who's now 10 years old. So he was born in March 2009. And just before, I guess, um, Joshua had been born, the Lord put it in our hearts as well that uh, our children would have a Christian education. We used the, the ACE curriculum, Accelerated Christian Education, and the Lord had put it on our hearts that you know, our children would you know, have a Christian education um, because we've seen just the fruit of it and how lovely it was, you know, in, in the McElrath house. And we just knew that, that that's what we wanted for our children as well. But again, that's all there was. And the Lord was putting it on our hearts to birth a school in Ballina Hinch. So we, we prayed. We needed people that would come along with the same heart as us, that would have the same desire to have their children brought up in this um, godly environment. 
we needed people to come with kids. <laughs> Yeah, and also as well, we, we needed somewhere to have the school. You know, Led had mentioned earlier, with a couple of the buildings we had, you know, the first house, the market house, you know, we, we didn't really have anywhere for kids' work or Sunday school. And then up in Eden Grove Halls, we had one little small room. It wasn't be any bigger little area than that platform, you know, for the crash facilities, you know. So where was the school going to be? So we needed a building, you know, that was going to be debt-free and um, to be able to for the school to be birthed. So as Travers just mentioned, praise the Lord, all £184,000 to the glory of God, you know, was provided to be able to have this building. And if you've ever been downstairs, there's uh, three little classrooms there. Well, the Lord had already started to bring people to the church. He brought the Nasses along. We prayed for kids. The Nasses came. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, obviously there's little Georgia there as well. We have um, Weanna Porter as well at the school and um, the four Nash girls and um the Woodsy, the two boys, Joshua and Reuben now, and, and the McElrath children. And, you know, it's just been, and, and there's another family as well that comes, um, Rebecca and Jonathan's, um, four, uh, the niece, their nieces and nephews, the four of them, there's uh, the Gallagher children. And, you know, for, um, so, so say that the building only came about, you know, a couple, a couple of years ago now, but, you know, for the last three years, we've just been meeting in this wee building um, a couple of days a week. And the Lord had brought people in with hearts to have their children, you know, with a Christian education. So we didn't, at that time, we didn't feel it was the the, the right time, you know, to, to open a Christian school uh, straight away. But a few of us would have home educated our children um, at home on a Monday and a Friday. And then we would have met here three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, just to just to educate our children together and for that bit of um, support and fellowship. So it's just been amazing how the Lord just has just led us every step of the way. You know, I, I laugh now almost because it was back in December 2013 that I had left the job that I was in in, in Danske Bank and I really thought... I'm leaving work and we're going to set up the school within the next few months of me leaving work, you know, but the Lord, his way is perfect, you know, 2013, 2000, like in January 2014, it seems absolutely inconceivable now, you know, the Lord needed to, the Lord knew what he was doing, what I'm trying to say is the Lord knew who he needed to add to it, you know, who he needed to bring to it, the children that he needed to bring to it, the, the teachers he needed to bring to it, I'm thinking there, there's Mr. Ben, for example, now he's full-time in the school, the, new, the Lord knew all of these things, that jigsaw puzzle, we might have these things in our mind, how it's all going to work out, but his way is perfect, you know, and it's just it's just wonderful, you know, to see what the Lord has birthed and will do. You know, that verse, we said it right at the outset, Isaiah 58 and 12, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old base places, and I do believe they that shall be of us, our children, if the Lord should tarry, they are the going to ones that are going to raise up the foundations of many generations. They will be the repairers of their breach, you know, the restorer of paths to dwell in. You know, if the Lord should tarry, I do know that, uh, you know, they they will take this mantle, you know, and just, you know, just leave a, you know, just go all out for God, you know, these um, young lives. So really that's Harmony Christian School, just praise Please pray, pray for us. We're in our infancy. We're, we're still young. Tomorrow morning at half ten, we have the school inspectors coming. So please pray for us. They'll be with for, with us for a few hours, and it's just wonderful to see what the Lord's doing, and just for the children to meet here, you know, up in devotions, assembly time, any prayer requests, any praise reports, all their wee hands shut up. You know, it's just wonderful. It would just bless your heart, and you know, yes, I mentioned all the. The different teachers and stuff as well but I think at last count there was about 16 other different people as well that have volunteered to help in the school you know might be driving them on the bus to the swimming pool it might be just coming for an afternoon to teach them some Irish dancing and um, uh, you know it might be coming to help me with a bit of administration and do some cutting and laminating but all of these things every joint is supplying and it just blesses me so much every day to walk through the doors of Harmony Christian School and just give God all the glory for what he has done and for what he's going to do in the days ahead. Amen. So when your kids asked you what we be I'm going to pounce on a few people again because this one 
I'll have to change this to bit of it. Is a stone that speaks of Christ as our healer. And we have known him to be a healer. Amen. Amen. Stephen's going to come. Marguerite was touched recently as well. Would you come? Amen. Leanne's going to come again. Just take a few seconds and stand. I know it should be given a whole night for this here. But listen, he's a wonderful healer. Amen. If you're sick tonight, God heals. And we're going to hear about that. Stephen, amen. And Marguerite, amen. Leanne, just a few seconds. If you use the mic for us, it'd be great. You know, it was just over a year ago that I was meant to go on a missionary trip to Nepal and India. But on the Sunday evening before, I felt ill. By the Tuesday night, my stomach had swollen out to here. I ended up at the A&E in the Ulster Hospital at 12 o'clock on Tuesday night, Patricia and myself. And by 7 o'clock the next morning after doing CT scans, blood tests, all types of different tests, they told me I had a mass cancerous tumour in my rectum. They told me that my bowels were very, very badly diseased, that my bowels were about to burst. They told me that it wasn't looking good for me, and this was serious. They had to operate me right away. So I called for Timothy, and one day the church come up and family come up, and we prayed that morning. We prayed. Porters came, took me down to the operating theatre at four o'clock that afternoon, and I was in the theatre for four hours. They opened me up, and they found nothing. Amen. They had saw a tumour which was six centimetres big on the scan. They told me the tumour had been there for 12 years. It was a slow growing tumour, uh, but they found nothing. They told me my bowels were covered in gross polyps, hundreds of them all over my, my bowel. There was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. That's the power of prayer. That's the God who we serve. He's a healer. So I don't know where you are tonight. You may be sick in your body, but you know something? We know someone who can touch you and he can heal you. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I had a condition um, a number of years back called intracranial hypertension. And basically what that means is I just had an excess of fluid all around my brain. And just the symptoms came on very suddenly. And the symptoms every single day was just a pressure headache. I had constant swishing in this left ear. I, had, I would have had slurred speech. I would have had tingling going up and down my arms and my legs. And this was every single day. Just the pressure of it was unbearable. And I remember the odd time I maybe would have been standing in bits or somewhere. I remember in, in Bow Street Mall and I would have had fluid just gush out my nose. Just the, the pressure and the fluid in my, in my brain was just, you know, just so accessible. And I visited a different uh, neurologist called Dr. Forbes over in Craig Avenue Area Hospital, and he's a very, very, you know, he's one of the top um, neurologists in the in the country. And he had said, you know, you're going to have this condition for the rest of your life. It had um, MRI scans, it had lumbar puncture, and uh, he'd give me um, four different tablets that I was to take every single day. You know, but as we've said, and as Brian mentioned, we believe in prayer, and we um, just asked the Lord and kept asking and seeking and knocking and said, Lord, we know you're a healer. You know, you are who, you, who God's word says you are. And um, we, um, we prayed to the Lord. And for 18 months, I had that condition, 18 months. And as a young mum, I had Joshua, who was just a, a toddler, um, a few years old back then. But, um, you know, just this constant bending up and down to pick your child all up and down. It just was un unbearable. So that for that 18 months, it it was it wasn't very. It was a very you know. It was a really low valley, you know, for for us as a family, and just keep kept praying and asking the Lord. But I remember one Sunday night after church, um, I'd been up at the up to ask for prayer again and for healing. And I remember Sister Laney um, had prayed with me. She's not here tonight, but um, and then after that service, we went up to we would have went up to Auntie Lila's house over in Dremore, um, just for for a bite of supper after church. And I remember Brother Davey just saying at the end of it, you know, I just really feel to pray again for um, Sister Leanne. So it just set me in the middle of the room and um, Brother Brent was there and David and a, a few others. We were just praying again for the Lord to touch me, you know. And on the Tuesday morning, praise the Lord, I woke up 
And I didn't have one symptom for the first time in 18 months. Just absolutely instantly, I woke up. I didn't have any swishing in my ear. I had no headache. I felt like I could skip down. I, well, I, I did skip down the road to the bus stop. You know, I was able to go into work and I was completely pain free. And I just knew this wasn't just a remission or anything. God had healed me. And from that day and hour, I didn't have another symptom again. Um, I had to go to the Craig Avon Hospital again for another scan and I knew God had touched me and he had healed me and I came off all my medication. I just knew God had done a complete complete work and I came off my medication and all and they did the scan and everything at the hospital and I remember the nurse just printing out the results and she says, oh, your medication seems to have really kicked in now, you know, these results are really good. I said, I'm not on any medication. Jesus healed me. And she sort of looked at me. She says, oh, well, the results seem to show, you know, that something's certainly happened. I'll have to give you these to your, to your neurologist. And, you know, Dr. Forbes had said, you know, I really can't explain this, but I do know the Lord touched me and he healed me. And I just want to give him all the praise tonight. I you know I'm Marguerite, Paula's mum, and um, I just wanted to, to let you know that, yes, you all know my testimony about the God miraculously providing a perfect, 100% perfect kidney for me, and only God could have done that. Doctors have told me that I had only 2% chance of getting the kidney, but God sent one along. I was like my identical twin, and I had testified to that. But the last August, it'll be a year in August, actually, that um, I was going through, like, nobody knew who, what it was. Every four to six weeks, I was going through, I don't even know what, how to explain it. My body just totally went. I was bedridden for about two weeks. My energy levels weren't coming back till about two weeks. So this was a vicious circle. This started last August. Doctors still don't know what it is. I don't know what it was, but it was it was here, and, and I did, every single month there was the same symptoms. You felt the coming on, and I just I was just at my wit's end. And there was one night um, Tim had called um, a healing meeting it was last August, and I says no, I says Lord, I'm going to go up because I knew that night. There was something different. I had been up before, but I knew that night there was something different. And that happened before when I was crying unto God in my living room when I was needing a kidney. And I had cried for many times, but I knew that day in that living room that there was something different in that room. And I walked out of that living room in 2007, and I knew something had moved in heaven. And I thank God for it because that's when I got my kidney a couple of months later. And I knew that night there was something different. I knew I was going to receive my healing. And I did because I haven't had nothing like that from last August. And it'll be here this August. And I praise his name and I thank him. Thank you, Lord. Oh God, there's not honey four stones right here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When your children ask you, What mean these stones? Friends want to tell us. <coughs> My stone tonight is outreach. Yeah. So that In this church, one of the keystones has been outreach. Uh, because in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, it says that Christ commanded us were to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This outreach has included tent missions held in the local uh, community estates in Windmill and in Langley, in which many of the people in here have given their testimonies. We've had Germans, we've had Americans, you know, we've had all different types of preachers. And it was here that my own first two kids, I lived in the estate windmill, you know, it was here that my own two first kids heard the gospel, you know, and I believe that was a strong witness. You know, I think the uh, 
The anthem was Sarah Grove's song, you know, a tent in the centre of town, you know, and a, that was a great witness in the town. It was a great witness to me. And it was here that uh, the tent pegs were first driven in to claim Ballin a Hinch for Jesus Christ. It was also here that many relationships were built up with the parents and the kids. And as a result, these relationships are still alive today. As well there, as the tent missions, we have had street outreach. There has been uh, in the, some of the 10 towns that are part of the church vision in County Down. There, those include Downpatrick, Castle Wellen and Balna Hinch. And it is no coincidence that when we are in Balna Hinch, as Lyd said earlier, on a Saturday night, we still bump into the kids that we met in the early years and the mums in the tent mission, and who sometimes they remember us even before we remember them. You know, I believe that was a strong witness. There was great relationships built up, you know. And uh, now that we're in the new building, we now have a coffee morning outreach, and many have come in, and Margaret's been one of them that has come in <laughs> through the coffee outreach. You know, but they're the lives. You know, there's people that come faithfully every week to that we outreach, and I believe those are the lives that Jesus Christ has been drawn to this church. You know, there might be nobodies and nothings in the eyes of this world, but I want to tell you they're everything mm -hmm. in the eyes of Jesus tonight. And uh, recently we've started a Saturday outreach then every other Saturday morning, and then we've also had local missions in Anna Hilt, Drummondes, Downpatrick, and the Shankill Road. And uh, I believe outreach is a keystone in this church. And the reason that I believe it is that because of a church reaching out, that's why I believe the Lord was able to save me. You know, and uh, much seed has been sown over the years, many tracts, many invitations, and many CDs. And although it's only been 14 years, I believe we're only truly be beginning to enter in to the blessings of souls that God has for each of us, friends. You see, over these past few weeks, you know, God has really been dealing with my heart, you know. There is, friends, going to be a great ingathering of souls in these days. You know, he says in his word, you know, because he says in his word, some sow, some plant and some water, but it's God that gives the increase. You know, he says, you know, don't wait four months to the harvest. He says the fields are white on the harvest today. You know, God has planted in my heart, I believe, you know, a passion to see souls saved, you know, and I do believe in these days, friends, there's going to be a great end gathering, you know, just as this next building and whatever else starts to open up, you know, people, I've had it, me and Lyd, you know, just over these past few weeks, you know, God has just birthed it and renewed it within us again, because I believe he's going to move, you know, and just the divine appointments that we've had, the people that we've spoken to, you know, Nicky the other week speaking to a man, those people with people in on Saturday, we've had people in Castle Wellen, but friends, I want to tell you, the People that God has been speaking to. We spoke to a young man out in the outreach in Castle Well. We were totally, me and Lyd were totally knackered. We didn't want to go. And I just knew, and Elaine says, well, sure, do you not just want to go and have a chip or whatever and have a bit of time, you know? But we knew just to push on. And we went, and the first person that was stopped, he says, this young fella, and he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to go to church, an Elam church in uh, Lisburn. He says, I did call out to the Lord one time. I wanted to be saved. He says, but then I got a girlfriend, and I was able to share the gospel with him. I says, that was the problem. He says, you didn't give all of your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a backslider. You know, we met another young man. He was sitting on a park bench. You know, and he, we walked over to him and says, do you ever think of God? He says, ah, well, I, I sort of have. I do think of God now and again. But I haven't had that encounter that you're talking about. I haven't had him really speak to me. I says, I says, and then Lyd says to him, you know, have you ever read the book of John? And he says, ah, no, I've never read it. He says, read your Bible and read the book of John. And he says, do you know what? Funny enough, he says, you know, I was working in a house last week and there was a man and he wanted us to build this step. And on the step, it said, John chapter 7 and verse 37. I believe that verse is, you know, if any man thirst, let him come unto me, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But he says, I've never had this encounter that you're talking about. And I says, what was his name again? Thomas. I says, Thomas, God's speaking to you. This is the encounter that you're looking for. I says, we're speaking to you now. A man standing preaching the gospel to you, putting John 7, 37 on the, on the step of his house. God is speaking to you. Go and read your Bible and you're going to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the fields are white on the harvest. Don't wait four months. They're ripe for the picking today. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Praise the Lord. When your kids ask you, What meaneth these stones? Seems what it comes to. This stone that I've got is missions. Missions. You know, Hank Brandt just quoted there the Jesus says the the fields are white on the harvest. But you know the laborers are few. You know, we are a mission center church. You know, that's where our heart lies, a great deal in missions. And I just want to give you a few facts and figures. You know, from the beginning when this church was formed, every tithe and offering that's made to this church, we tithe 10% of it. So everything comes in every Sunday morning and Sunday evening, 10% of it goes to missions. And I'm going to, going to ream off a few, few places where it goes. Local missions, foreign missions, CEF workers, Bibles to China, nuns to North Korea, missionaries in Pakistan, Kenya, Ghana, Kosovo, India, Nepal, Brazil, Israel, Fiji, Lebanon, Cambodia, Zimbabwe, Nebraska, and even away up in the Shetland Islands. And we, we help support the revival movement over there in Kanaan. We support churches being built in, in India and Nepal and through Asia Link. <clears throat> From this church started uh, way back all those 14 years ago, right up until now, April 2019, we as a church have given £84,830. Sown, praise God for it. Praise, sown in the mystery. That's you, friends. That's you sown into the work of God. You know, from this church, Trevor Brown, Big Hassan there, myself and, and Jonathan and Ben and Naomi and others, we've went, we've smuggled Bibles into, into, into China, we've smuggled Bibles into Vietnam, we've smuggled Bibles, where else Trevor, into, into Laos, we've, we've went down the Mekong River 10 hours in a boat, sitting like that for 10 hours with a rock Rucksacks filled with Bibles, we smuggled them into, into, into Laos and we met someone in a, in, a, in a shady place with a wee van and we had to get the Bibles in that van and then we are away and he was away. That's some of the people in this church sitting here tonight. Friends, our heart is for missions. But you know, the missionary work doesn't need to start across in Africa or in Asia or in, or in the Americas. You know, there's a mission field here. There's a mission field right outside your door. There's a mission field in your work. There's a mission field in your home. There's a mission field out in the streets of Ball the Hens, wherever you You're a missionary. If you're born again and you're washed in the precious blood of Jesus, then friend, you are a missionary. You go and proclaim the glorious truth of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Amen. But when your children ask you, What made of these stones? Nikki's going to come with number 12. The last stone, here. Um, I'm holding a stone that says, Faith on it, you know, because what we have seen is not the fullness of God's heart, even for us, you know, even for us as a local people. You know, what does God desire to do among us there's probably more in this stone infinitely more than all the blessings already we have received infinitely more if we will trust him i was thinking about genesis 18 where god visits abraham and he comes and says the angel of the lord and it is christ himself and he tells abraham what's going to happen he gives him the word you're going to have a son and abraham says shall i Shall I surely bear a child which am old? This is what the Lord says. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. And your wife's going to have a son. Now, at the time appointed, I will return. Do you know everything about this is Christ returning? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Young people, are you ready to meet the Lord? We saw a girl up there at 22 years of age, fully healthy, full of life, was taken home, was taken home. Thank God she walked with them. She was ready to go. She received her crying. But some of you are not ready to meet the Lord. Some of you sit under the word of God and are not ready to meet the Lord. At the appointed time, the Lord will return. But thinking about the word of the Lord that he gave to Abraham here, you know, 
He says, at the appointed time, you're going to return. I thought about Abraham, you know, did he get mocked when he parked that pram outside the door? Because it was 10 years, 10 years until this promise was fulfilled. God came, gave him the word, but he had to have a lot of ordinary days in between. He had to have a lot of ordinary days getting up, getting dressed, doing his work, coming home from work, looking after Sarah, having issues to deal with. He had to have a lot of ordinary days. Friends, you and I had to have a lot of ordinary days. We need to know what it's like to live ordinary life, and we all do. And then sometimes we'll have the devil in our ear because we'll have so many ordinary days. You see, it wasn't true. You see, all that was a figment of your imagination, that angel that day. You never even got a word. God said, you never got anything. This is the stone of faith. Now, Abraham had a big blip in between because Abraham maybe got a bit embarrassed, parked that, that pram outside the door and a lot of mockers and a lot of scoffers. Look at the age of him. But there was two things had to happen, and I believe that two things have to happen in our lives. God has to show us we can't do it, and God has to show the people around us we can't do it. And they're the two parts of faith that I know the Lord has dealt with me personally. You know, about three years ago, through his word, the Lord said to me that he was going to try it. You know, he was going to bring me in the time of testing. So, so you're looking all around you at this and this, oh, I think I know what that one's going to be, Lord. Right, I'm ready there. Yep, yep, I'm ready for that one. You know, it's a bit tight. And then he brings you into something where you do not want to walk in. And you cry out to him, Lord, there must be another way to do this. There must, you know, Abraham said to the Lord, Lord, there must be another way. And he ended up birthing an Ishmael. And he had a lot of trouble and heartache in his household because of it. But the Lord is so merciful. How many times have we put our hand to it and done it ourselves? You know, it all sounds very romantic when you put it into a few hours, but there's been a lot of failure in between all this. There's been a lot of mess up. And every time, you know, my favorite verse in scripture, he restoreth my soul. Every time, every time when we come to him, he lifts us up and he puts us back on the path and he restores us and he revives his word within us. He breathes on us again. The Spirit of the Lord breathes on us. This stone of faith is for everything the Lord wants to do in the days of head. You know, will you, will you hold to the word of the Lord that he's given you personally? Will you hold to the word of the Lord that he gives us in his word? Are you ready to meet him? And are you ready to hold that stone of faith through the ordinary days? Abraham would never have been able to lead his son up the mountain if he hadn't lived through a lot of ordinary days. Keep walking with God, believe him. You know, Brother Glenn Dunn taught us a great thing. He says, if you can think the thought of God, you know, and just personally again, you know, I know when God put even the very vision for here, you know, we looked foolish. It wasn't that God was mocking us. God doesn't. He leads us. He's going to have to, you know, we think we're a lot more spiritual as Brother Glenn Dunn taught us than what we actually are. And he has to bring us to a place. He has to bring us often to a place of nothingness. So it might feel weak and you might look foolish. And God's in it all. And I know when God spoke to us about the school 10 years ago. And it was like Abraham, we parked that pram outside the door. You know, I know. God had to toughen my skin a lot. I know it looked foolish. But if you can think the thought of God... We had no kids, we had no money, we had no facilities, we had nothing. When this work started, we had nothing. I mean, we had nothing. <laughs> what do I have? Now? No, but what I'm saying, this isn't it. So great, he's given us somewhere to cover our heads, but this isn't it. This isn't it. What does God want to do? What does God want to birth? The seed, the natural seed, had to die within Abraham and everybody had to make sure it was dead. You know, God will do something in your life if you let him and if you call on him. But you must call. Faith isn't just sitting back and waiting to see what God's going to do. Faith is in reading this word of God and saying, Lord, you've said that. I'm going to stand until you do it within me. Nothing, God said, these words came from the Lord. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Amen. Amen. But there's more stones. 
Not tonight. Don't panic, Tommy. Tommy put his head down there and shake it. You're all right. You'll get your supper in a minute. The kettle's on. You just don't what everyone else is thinking. It's all right. <laughs> Somebody else is going to put a stone there. Somebody else by faith is going to step out because there's more stones to be put in. And maybe, maybe the stone of unsaved loved ones, mm -hmm. yes. when the prodigal sons come home. Amen. Maybe the planting of churches in Castlewell and Belfast and down Patrick. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of these kids, maybe a Joshua Woods would lay hold of a stone and plant a church for Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe, or more. Maybe there's going to be a missionary that's going to be the stone maybe in another few years' time and say, you know what? I put the stone because I'm a missionary for Jesus and he sent me to a foreign field. Maybe one of our kids, there's more. Brent said, 500. Anyone know what that means? Believing for 500 souls at least to be saved were and bound the hinge. Does anyone believe that could happen? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know I even know it can happen? Because it happened in 1923 on the church meadow when W.P. Nicholson came there was 500 souls saved in Balna Hinch. Can you believe that? You know what the Bible tells me? Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. If he's done it before, guess what? He can do it again. And we're believing for this Revival. <coughs> revival. May the stone of revival be placed in the wall that God would move by his spirit across this land, across this island, a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And just in a few months' time, you know the Lord blessed us to purchase a building for £92,500. By the way, you've heard this the whole way through this this wall. We have no money. <laughs> no, words we're skint, right? But you know, when we need it, it comes. Isn't that the amazing thing? He just always gives it when we need it. But as you probably worked out, you heard the word nothing quite a lot. But you know, he's no man's debtor. There's going to be an our classroom. There's going to be a drop-in center. It's going to be an honesty box cafe. Imagine that in Balna Hinch. You don't have to pay. But if you want to give a donation, you can. Margaret, you'll be there every day. Oh, I'll be there every day. <laughs> <laughs> and there's going to be... Sorry, <laughs> She'll bring her Tupperware in, tell you, watch her. And listen, and there's going to be... You see, there's going to be souls saved. There's going to be a move of God. There's going to be a new sanctuary. There's going to be a minor hall. You're going to be, listen, I'm saying all this by faith, but you're going to be able to walk through doors here into a new sanctuary. We're going to see souls saved. We're going to see God come. We're going to see his power unleashed. We're going to see the gospel preached. We're going to see men delivered, women set free, lives restored, homes restored, marriages restored. This is the gospel. Somebody can put a stone in the wall. God stir in your heart. You know, one person might have put the stone, but you know what happens? Like Nehemiah, when they're building the wall, people gathered round and they built. We're co-workers together to build the wall. And let me tell you something as we close. As David comes, and we're going to just close with a song. But let me tell you something. Jesus, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, and all the crowd were crying out and praising him. You know what Jesus said? Or the, the, the Pharisees said to Jesus, Lord, these people are praising you and calling out your name. And, and Lord, tell them to stop. And the Lord said, these stones. See if we don't praise him tonight for what he's done. And let me tell you something, there's so much more. This is like our big toe in the waters. There is so much more to come. But see if we don't praise him for what he has done. If we don't praise him, then the stones will cry out. And I'll do it one more time. When your children ask you, What did Jesus do? 
stones. Kids, put stones in the wall. Build for Jesus. This is the best life and the only life to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. We're going to commit the night to the Lord. I appreciate you listening so well. I know it's went on a wee bit, but it's been worth it to hear it all. And there's so much more we could have said. There's so many other testimonies. And as Nikki said, you know, there's also many things of tears and disappointments. But you know, in it all, times, you know, when the Lord called Don Joy home, it was a very difficult time for Andy and Ruth, for them as a family, but for a church family, it was a very difficult time because it's a family. But no, we've known the Lord to be a comforter. We've known his arms to come around us. We've seen the hand of the Lord upon us. Brothers and sisters, he's a wonderful saviour. You're not saved in this room tonight. Get right with God. Live for Jesus. What a life to live. If you're not saved, get saved tonight. Give your heart to Jesus. If you're a backslider here tonight, listen to me. Time's short. Don't waste your life living for the devil in the world. Give him your heart and live for Jesus. What a life you can live for him tonight. One day to go with him, to be with him forever. We're going to close tonight. Do you know what we need to go forward? Do you know what we need? We started it with the song tonight. Do you know what we need for the next chapter? Anybody know what we need? We need a fresh anointing. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, we need you to come tonight and touch us all afresh to go forward together as a church to glorify your name in this land. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we need a fresh anointing. Jeff, you come. Lord, we need a fresh anointing we cannot borrow from yesterday. Come and feed us, Holy Spirit, teach us such Jesus, His will. This journey is a wilderness. Our spirits get barren and dry. Nothing in this world can fill this empty longing. Only you can satisfy. Lord, we a fresh anointing we cannot borrow from yesterday. Come and feed us, Holy Spirit, teach us of Jesus, His will, His way. Restore the joy of our salvation. Bring healing to this land. We need a breath from heaven above. Revive us once again. A fresh anointing we cannot borrow from yesterday. Come and feed us, Holy Spirit, teach us of Jesus, His will, His will. Lord, we need a fresh anointing.
trust of Jesus, His will, His way. Thank you, Lord. Brother Hassan, you can the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we tonight we do thank you, Father God, for the day of grace in which we still find ourselves in. That when the Father God with the arms of Jesus welcomes every man, woman, or boy and girl, Father God, your heart is towards all men. That none shall perish and come under repentance. And Father God, we thank you. You're abundant in mercy. You're abundant in salvation. You're abundant in forgiveness. And Lord, you seek and you search. And Lord God, you're calling those prodigals to come home. While the day of grace in which we find ourselves in. But we thank you. You don't only see it, but Lord, we can say of a truth that you satisfy. Father God, you satisfy every need these hearts are longing. And only Christ and Christ alone can satisfy them. So Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Even at times we remain faithless. But Father God, you remain faithful. Yeah. because that's who you are Lord we can say praise God whom all blessings flow and Lord we've heard about a time and time again of healing of restoration of deliverance of providence and Lord we can say yeah. we'll love you because you first loved us and showed us love by Lord we're feeling the lovely Lord Jesus Christ tell us mm -hmm. so Lord we're asking you'll have your way with each heart represented here tonight, depart us with your blessing. Even bless our time of fellowship one with another. Yeah. Even bless our hands of our But Father God, keep the urgency today if you hear his voice. Harden not your heart. So Lord, we tell you afresh, we love you. Depart us with your blessing. For we ask it all in that wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Amen.